Satoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality Om Peace, peace, peace. Good morning, namaste. Good morning. <laughs> and happy Father's Day. <laughs> yes. I think the happiest are more than children and fathers, the happiest are the, the uh, restaurant owners in New York, I think in Manhattan. <laughs> They're all overworked today. Yes. It's interesting, the history of Father's Day, I was reading it up, and uh, Mother's Day actually came before Father's Day. And Father's Day came about because of a daughter. She, uh, she was a family uh, like a, of children raised by a single father, long time ago, in the late 19th century. And this lady, she petitioned for a Father's Day. <laughs> so it's a daughter who made it happen, Father's Day. So this is what we call the Ask Swami session, where there are lots and lots of questions from all over the world, especially over the uh, internet, we get so many questions. And I thought it's impossible to you know, solve those questions over the email. Um, one answer leads to more questions, basically. That's what happens. Uh, and so we thought we'd have this where the questions would be put in public and we could discuss them and may give some observations, try to provide some answers and they could be recorded and uploaded and so everybody could benefit from these sessions. Um, I was just thinking about it, what exactly are we trying to accomplish here? It's not really that you solve, uh, that when I try to give answers to these questions, I solve anybody's doubts or questions. One question always, if you answer one, it leads to more questions. Uh, our questions are really answered from within. You know? When we listen to these, these answers, these observations, these remarks, and then we think about it and ponder upon it, and sometimes we get this aha moment, I get it. Okay, I, I understand, now this question is solved. In fact, a question is properly solved when it's dissolved. You know, it sort of melts away. And that's an internal realization. So the answers that we try to give here, or the observations or the information we try to give here, insights we try to give here, are uh, more like suggestions. So we need to chew upon them internally. Uh, and often they are helpful to others. I mean. So I always say that don't be too eager to ask your question or wait, when is my question going to come up? Sometimes listen to the questions of others and we find it's useful for us. So we'll do it in, uh, we do two things here. One is a selection of the many, many, many questions which come to us over <laughs> the internet, uh, which Diane is going to read out from here and I'll try to um, uh, share my observations on that. And then we will also have questions from the live audience here. I'll ask for your questions, raise your hand, then I'll call upon you, come up here, there's a microphone in the front, tell us your name and ask a pointed question, you know, like brief to the point. All right, let's go. Time. Good morning, Swamiji. Good morning. Uh, Shirag S. from Bangalore, India asks, I am learning Atma Shatakam attributed to Adi Shankacharya. My question is in the line, I do not fall into the triad of experience, the experiencer, and the experienced. But consciousness is the eternal witness. It witnesses and experiences mind and body, doesn't it, Swamiji? Can you resolve this paradox? Yeah. Let me just dwell on this question a little bit before we try to answer it. It's always interesting if I understand the question and then try to answer it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we don't know what, what are we talking about. 
Um, so it's a good question. Um, have you noticed those who have been coming to this session how the questions keep getting better and better and more and more pointed and more and more difficult actually? <laughs> um, all right. So what he has asked he here is, all our knowledge is of the form knower, known, and the method or instrument of knowledge. In Sanskrit, pramata, the knower, I am the knower, and prameya, the object of knowledge. So maybe this microphone is the object of my knowledge. I see, I see it. How do I, how do I know this? By the instrument of sight, visual perception. So pratyaksha is perception. The Sanskrit word for perception. So there are three things involved here. I the knower, in this case I the seer, and the object that I see, and the method by which I see it, you know, the eyes. You are also a knower, and the object of your knowledge is my words, and the method of your, you know, knowing these words is ears. So it's auditory perception. The Sanskrit words for these three are pramata, the knower, uh, prameya, the known object, and pramana, the source of knowledge or the instrument of knowledge. So basic, this is basic epistemology, uh, the philosophy of how we know things. Um, it could be, the instrument of knowledge could be perception, you could see, hear, smell, taste, touch things, or it could be inference, you know, we always make common sense inference, so, um, it's maybe you look at the train schedule and you look say oh there's a train at 11:10 and this time is coming now so there must be a train now i infer uh, from that knowledge that every time at 11:10 a train comes in the subway there it's 11:10 now therefore there must be a train there i don't see it i haven't seen it yet but based on my previous experience i make an inference so inference is another source of uh, of knowledge then there are other sources of knowledge another ma main source of knowledge is authority we don't think so, but it's true. Uh, often, even all of the science and all we do, we think it's inference, but it's not really inference. Only when those who produce that knowledge, it's inference for them. They collect data and make inference about it. But when we learn it, we learn it through textbooks and professors and the information is given to us and we take it on trust, on authority, on good authority. Yeah. That's the whole meaning of peer-reviewed journals, you know, on good authority. You, you need to... There's a community of knowledge and they verify that this knowledge is trustworthy and they give it to us and we accept it. So an authority, it could be scientific authority, it could be religious authority, whatever it is. So these are the ways of knowing. Now, what he is asking is that he read in a poem by Shankaracharya, which tells us about the self, that you are pure consciousness. You are neither the known nor the knower nor the instrument of knowledge. The three things, the triad, any knowledge is these three things. So you, it's a classic way of pointing out pure consciousness, that you are not the knower, you are not the known object, and you are not the instrument of knowledge. Clearly you're not the known object because pure consciousness is not an object. It cannot be known as, you know, like the microphone. So it's not a known object. And you are not even the knower, and not even the instrument of knowledge. Pure consciousness is not the eyes or the ears or even the mind. Then he's asking the question, but we always are told that pure consciousness in Vedanta is the witness of all experience. You're, you're the witness consciousness. So are you the knower, for example? Are you part of that knower, known and um, method of knowledge or are you not? Now, do we begin to see what is the question? Yeah. All knowledge is knower, know, knowable, and the method of knowledge. And uh, we are taught the, that uh, Shankaracharya, we are taught that you are the witness of all knowing in, in uh, Vedanta. You are witness consciousness. But there Shankaracharya is saying you are not the knower, you are not the knowable, you are not the method of knowledge, instrument of knowledge. So which is it? The answer is this. There is a distinction between consciousness, the witness consciousness and the knower. Let me repeat this. There is a distinction between the witness consciousness and the knower. What happens is this. You are consciousness itself, according to Advaita Vedanta. We are that. 
and this consciousness is reflected in the mind and the mind what do you mean by reflected in the mind the mind somehow has this unique characteristic of reflecting consciousness it's like you know what it's like it's like a mirror reflecting your face a mirror is just an object there are all sorts of objects here you look and looking at all these objects and you see a curtain here you see a swami here you see flowers there you see pictures there but if i hold a mirror up what will happen you'll see a mirror but also you'll see yourself that's the unique thing if you look at the curtain you don't see yourself you just see the curtain but the mirror is also an object just like the curtain it is a unique property capacity of reflecting back your face to to you so on that analogy mind is something that also reflects consciousness and therefore reflecting consciousness it becomes a knower so the mind plus reflected consciousness how is it a knower whatever is happening in the world our senses gather that information and dump it in the mind so uh, with eyes gather visual information forms colors shapes ears gather auditory information you know sounds and all uh, uh, vibrations tongue nose skin and all of that information is dumped in the mind in the mind therefore there it's like visualized as a lake in which ripples are set out because of the information coming in from outside and what else is there in the mind the reflected consciousness and that reflected consciousness illumines whatever is going on in the mind another good example is the sun in the sky and you put a pot of water there and the uh, in the water you will find a little flickering shining little sun a reflected sun and that little sun can also have a you know it behaves like the real sun in a, in a tiny way it illumines something just nearby it can do that and so whatever is happening in that little pot of water is also illumined by the little flickering light similarly whatever is happening in our minds is illumined by the this reflected consciousness this illumination of whatever is happening in the mind is called knowledge by us and it takes a long time to explain it it happens instantaneously it's happening all the time so what what's happening is when i look at the when i focus on the microphone and uh, an image of the microphone a mental image of the microphone is created you know the light is reflected from the microphone it goes into the eyes and from the eyes the, through the optic nerves electric sim- you see very interesting the microphone doesn't go into the eyes and then you have to call 911 <laughs> uh, it's a it's just light goes into the eyes whatever we see in the world it's very interesting whatever we see in the world people animals you know plants um, just sky and earth all that goes into the eyes is just light reflected light that's all all it can collect and then there an image is formed uh, and then from there the even the image is not there anymore after that just it's like tiny bursts of electricity racing along your optic nerves to certain brain centers and then what happens nobody knows nobody knows i mean scientifically nobody knows we all know practically what happens we get a mental image how those little bursts of electricity become a mental image what's the connection that's the hard problem of consciousness anyway but what i'm saying is the mental image in the mind Uh, the, it's an image in the mind that is illumined by the reflected consciousness and that's what we call knowledge because we get at that moment we get the i get the feeling here i am seeing a microphone so this is knowledge now when shankaracharya says i am not you are not the knower you are not the object of knowledge you are not the instrument of knowledge what he means is um the object of knowledge is this microphone the means of knowledge are the eyes and the brain and the uh, mind and whatever and the knower is the reflected consciousness you with the help of that reflected consciousness in the mind you become the knower but what are you really you are the pure consciousness it's just like saying telling telling the sun that you are not the pot you're not the water you're not even the reflected sun you are the that's one sun in the sky so in that sense now notice in in that sense you are not one of those three the knower the knowable and the instrument of knowledge you with me so far yeah 
not very confident. <laughs> Just let, take it in this sense. The witness consciousness is not the, um, the knower, the knowable, and the instrument of knowledge. However, the knower cannot function without the witness consciousness. Another example is very helpful here. Sunlight and moonlight. So at night, the moon is the illuminer. The earth in the darkness at night is the illumined. And how does the moon illumine the, uh, uh, the earth? Through moonlight. So you can, you can happily tell the sun, Oh sun, you are not the moon, you are not the moonlight, you are not the uh, earth. Right? And yet, it's also true, there wouldn't be any moonlight without sunlight. Right? So without sunlight, the moon wouldn't reflect uh, anything. And there would be no moonlight coming on the earth. And the earth would not be illumined. So, the, so imagine the moon is the knower. Right? And the moonlight is the instrument of knowledge. And what is known is the earth at night. None of it would be possible without the sun. And yet the sun is none of them. That, I think, makes it clear. In one sense, the moonlight is not sunlight. In another sense, uh, uh, moonlight is nothing but sunlight. So. I remember this cartoon I saw. Y you know, there is supposed to be these uh, vampires, they cannot s stand sunlight. So they come out of their coffin uh, at night. Uh, and then they scare people. Right? <laughs> now there was this cartoon. Uh, I remember that uh, this vampire has come out of his coffin and is scaring uh, this guy. And this guy is a scientist. He's very scared. And the vampire comes at, at him and then um, and there's moonlight. And then the scientist tells the vampire, you do know that the moonlight is sunlight, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the vampire screams in pain, pain and <laughs> rushes back to his coffin. <laughs> so it's enough to drive him back to his coffin. I knew a Swami once who lived in a coffin. Yes, yes. Um, there's this Swami in the Himalayas. In the, uh, this, so some of the Swamis, they live in, co uh, in cottages. Some live in caves. And this Swami lived in a very nice cave. Uh, so I went to visit him. And this is very high in Himalayas, on the bank of the, the Ganga there. Uh, stunning scenery and everything. Now what happened was, in that cave, years ago, a very famous Swami used to live there and he practiced meditation. Then he went out and taught, he became very famous. Um, when he died, I think it was his last wish to be taken back to the ca that cave and, you know, Swami's bodies are generally not um, burnt sometimes and uh, they are often, they are either immersed in water. So. That's what they did with the fall that followers of that Swami did that. They take, took his dead body in a coffin and went to that cave. And then they, I think, they immersed the body in the water. But the coffin was left behind. It was a nice coffin. <laughs> now, years and years later, there was this other Swami living there whom I met. And he said uh, that, uh, that, you know, when it gets too cold, I, I <laughs> crawl into the coffin and I see snug and warm in there. So he doesn't have those uh, preconditioning. You wouldn't want to go li live inside a coffin. He doesn't have those ideas. He, for him, it's just a nice snug box so where he's, he's happy. And when it's time to get up, he opens the co coffin lid and climbs out of it. <laughs> so that's the, um, that's the answer to the question. Yes, you, the pure consciousness, you are neither the knower, nor the object of knowledge, nor the instrument of knowledge. And yet, Without you, the, neither the knower would function, nor the instrument of knowledge would function, nor the object of knowledge would be known. No knowledge is possible without you, and yet you are the witness. You are not involved in any of it. Um, and this is something that we can experience ourselves. All right, I'll leave it till later. There's something else I could have added. Anyway, we have to go ahead. Um, let's do one more question and then I'll go to the uh, audience here. Uh, this question is from Stuart Monday. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your conversation with Sam Harris, but it did raise a couple of questions for me. 
I am curious how you think science, in principle, can study something with no objective qualities like consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. Science being based on observation and experimentation seems to me to be inherently based on perception and logic. And second, as you know, the traditional perspective is that Vedanta is a pramana for knowing the self. As a pramana, it must meet the criteria of providing knowledge that is unique versus what can be gained from other pramanas, example, perception and logic. So therefore, if we say that science can tell us about the self, we are blowing up the entire foundation for Vedanta as a pramana, which leads to numerous philosophical problems. Please explain. Another good question. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's again understand the question, what he's trying to say here clearly. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, pramana is instrument of knowledge, so it was, as we just discussed. So this is related to the earlier question. Now, Vedanta is supposed to be a pramana, instrument of knowledge for showing us who we are, the self, that you are Brahman. The Upanishads are the texts which point out your real nature. So they are the pramana, the source of knowledge for showing what you are. Now, one principle of epistemology is that the instruments of knowledge, they function exclusively with regard to their object. What it means is, what the eyes reveal to me, the ears don't reveal that to me. Uh, if I say that uh, the, f the flower is so colorful, the flower arrangement is so colorful, and if you say, no, I don't hear that. Hearing is not a proof for how colorful the flower arrangement is, right? This dish is so tasty. And if somebody says, but I can't see that. You can't see taste. You have to taste it with your tongue. Tongue is the instrument for taste. Color is, uh, the eyes are the instrument for color. Yeah. Ears are the instrument for sound. Uh -huh. And then the inference, scientific in inference is the instrument for, so suppose somebody says, you say that there are atoms all around here. I can't see them, so there aren't atoms. Instrument for uh, the, the atoms, for seeing the atoms is not the eyes. It's through scientific information, you gather data and on that basis, you postulate that there are things like atoms. So, there are these different instruments of knowledge and no notice one thing about them. They give knowledge about something particular which other instruments cannot. If other instruments of knowledge start intruding in the area of each other, you know, there will be confusion. You will never know anything for certain. There will be conflict. One will tell you something and the other instrument will deny that. Then you don't know. Now, the Upanishads are supposed to be the instrument of knowledge for knowing the self, the pramana for knowing the self. And therefore the question here is, if you say science, by science somehow we can know that we are the self, I mean, we are Atman. We are the self. Everybody knows. I am, I am myself. Who else could I be? But the self is existence, consciousness, bliss. This it, it can be known by science if you start saying that. Then you are coming in conflict with Upanishads, Vedanta. Vedanta claims exclusive, you know, that it's a pramana. This is my area. Vedanta can reveal. Science cannot reveal that you are Brahman. And there's good reasons. Why not? Are you just stipulating that? Are you being fanatical about it? No, because science requires some objective data to work. And witness consciousness, pure consciousness, is not an object out there. It is that to which everything else is an object. It is consciousness itself. It's you yourself. It's not a thing. Therefore, if the person who asked this question, you will see in my conversation with Sam Harris or with anybody else, you will notice carefully that I, uh, that I word my statements carefully. I do not say that science can reveal the Atman. Mm -hmm. I will never make a direct statement like that. Because I'm aware of this conflict. And it will make a serious problem. See, the science as it operates now, yeah, it... Um, uh, it's as he said it's based on objective data and reasoning on objective data if something does not have objective features how will the science even get started okay so you're right this is a long winded way of uh, saying that you're right uh, science does not cannot uh, 
should not, need not reveal the Atman, reveal that you are Brahman or Atman. Upanishads are enough for that, Vedanta is enough for that. But is science entirely useless? No. There is, think about it, how do the Upanishads actually reveal that you are Brahman? Even the Upanishads use the method of neti neti, not this, not this. They will show you, you are not the body, you are not the mind, whatever you thought you were, you are not that. And then intuitively, you are supposed to catch what you are. What do you mean intuitively? It's, I can't, uh, that's the closest word I can use. Consciousness is self-evident and self-revealed. Now I'm using those words very carefully. Self-evident and self-revealed. And therefore, when all our confusions about what we are are cleared up by the Upanishads, you're not this, you can clearly, I will show to you, you cannot be the body, you cannot be the mind, you cannot be this limited personality, then it suddenly becomes clear to us what was always there, that I am this limitless awareness in which the mind and the body and the limited personality appeared, in which the entire universe of experience appeared, I am that limitless awareness. It becomes clear to me. That is self-knowledge, self self-realization. But how did you do it? How did the Upanishads help us? By not this, not this. They can't directly point it out also. Because language cannot point it, let alone science. Language cannot talk about it. Even concepts in the mind cannot... <laughs> See, concepts in the mind are also the knower. And they are, but they are all lit up by you, the consciousness. They are all powered by you, the consciousness, in a certain sense. Now, what I am trying to say in the conversation with Sam Harris and, and elsewhere also, is that um, science can also help us in that negative sense. It can show to us that consciousness cannot be reduced to matter. After making all sorts of efforts to show that consciousness is nothing but the brain, we have ended up with the hard problem of consciousness. Thanks to David Chalmers. That's what science has done. More we are investigating the brain, more we learn about the brain, but more we see that consciousness still remains a mystery. What does science do? The new science of artificial intelligence, the chat GPT and everything else, all sorts of artificial intelligence programs and devices. Um, notice how they are replicating, imitating characteristics of the human mind which we thought were uniquely human. Creativity. Intelligence, decision making, memory of course, even a calculator has more memory than we, we have, I mean more uh, reliable memory let's say. Um, perception, see your, the Google uh, car, what is it, the, the driverless car, uh, it drives a car like just like you or even better than you, certainly better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so. It does all these things which we thought were uniquely human. It can write stories and poems, actually, and pretty good ones too, the chat GPT. So, my take on this is, you know, what, it, what struck me? They are able to replicate everything that our minds do except one thing, consciousness. They, these devices are not conscious. They are not conscious. It says, says who? Don't ask me. You just go, go and ask the people in Silicon Valley, the people who are designing these things, and you ask them, so have you designed them for consciousness? No. Why not? Because first of all, we don't even know what consciousness is. Now think how interesting that is. In some ways, um, intelligence, creativity, these are very complex things. To model them, to simulate them in artificial um, entities like um, you know, chat GPT, it's a very difficult task. It's only now beginning to become possible with enormous amounts of computing power. Compared to that, consciousness should have been a simple task. Simulating consciousness should have been simple. Because what does consciousness do after all? It does only one thing. Only one thing. It gives you first person experience. Just experience. Anubhav feels like something. That's all consciousness does. Then how is it that that simple thing cannot be replicated in these machines? Everything else can be replicated. That shows us that science by its own efforts in a negative way is beginning to isolate everything else from consciousness. Yeah. So this is, this is my take on what science can do and cannot do. Uh, 
yeah i'll leave it at that can we take have a question from the live audience here um so we'll come the lady here first can you come up here and ask tell us your name and give us the question yes veronica pranam swami ji there has been a deep spiritual quest since i can remember about brahman about the ultimate truth the quest has been through questions deep internal inquiries seva ashrams gurus meditation spiritual text videos on non dualism the list to know and understand is quite extensive and although truth can be felt behind the words that are heard behind experiences behind people and interactions there are still moments that arise when another doubt or curiosity comes in and questions this truth or limited knowing this leads me to conclude that i do not yet truly know brahman nor do i have the deepest understanding of it it is also realized that to know brahman is also a desire but nonetheless remains as the most powerful of all desires in the world how is one guided to know brahman the ultimate truth genuinely and authentically beyond the intellect beyond any doubt beyond any thought so that despite whatever happens and continues to happen in life all that is known is that brahman alone is how does it become so real that it is an unshakable experience this yearning is ever growing and in desperation to be quenched please help me truly understand all right so i see three uh, three at least two two parts to this question uh, one I, i can answer directly first is that uh, you just observe that yeah yes the desire to know brahman is also another desire but another very powerful desire it's not a problem sometimes people pose this as a problem isn't the desire to know god to realize god to be spiritual to become enlightened just another desire it is a desire but it's not just another desire uh-huh. it's a desire that destroys all other desires and frees you from desire from the problem of this limited being desiring other limited things it frees you sri ramakrishna talks about um, you know sweets you have to be a bengali who loves sweets <laughs> and sweets causing uh, acidity acid reflux and then he says sugar candy is also sweet in uh, indians know this mishri but if you uh, rock candy rock candy is also sweet but if you put it in water and make a sharbat out of it and drink it it destroys acidity so that's sort of convoluted explanation for what sri ramakrishna said is just a simple example uh, he said that sweets cause acidity that means they they cause trouble to you and this is another kind of sweet which frees you from that trouble similarly the desire for god is not to be counted among other desires it frees you from samsara it takes you to liberation so that's good that's the straightforward answer to this, that observation but i have studied i have practiced i get some insights you sense the truth behind the teachings and yet sometimes we have this doubt again so that leads me to believe that i do not know that i do not know brahman yet then you asked that how do i know brahman so clearly so powerfully that it becomes very clear in the midst of life all the time in fact effortlessly clear that only brahman is okay there are two parts to this question the first part is doubt that is not so difficult to remove just consider this to have a doubt you must be conscious you must be aware Uh, the doubt implies without and doubt implies without any doubt that you are the doubter <laughs> the one thing that doubt implies is that the doubter exists it immediately proves that uh, it proves that it proves that you are consciousness in fact every experience in our life proves that i am aware all right there was something that i wanted to say since the first question but this will be a good time to say it I want to show demonstrate this right now. Follow this carefully. What will I demonstrate? That your own existence is self-evident and it's self-luminous. In Sanskrit, sat chit. The self-evident part of it's a self-evident part of it is um, not very difficult to demonstrate. One thing nobody ever doubts is I am. My own existence is never doubted. anything that i know can be doubted 
whatever I'm seeing in the world. It could be a dream. It could be a hallucination. It can be doubted. I could wake up the next moment and I'd think that and realize that I was dreaming all the time. I was not in class with Swami. I was just napping and I was dreaming the whole thing. It's possible. So Descartes, for example, famously, he set out with this um, project of doubt, doubting whatever could be doubted. And he wanted to find a firm ground for all knowledge from which to build up knowledge, something that could never be doubted. And he found that his own existence can never be doubted. Cogito ergosum, that I think therefore I exist. Even if I doubt it, I'm thinking. That cannot be doubted. So my own existence cannot be doubted. I am, this can never be doubted. In every experience of life, there's one thing that's constant. I am. Right now, whatever is going on here, we are all certain about one thing. I am. We spend not even a split second considering whether I am or am I not. Nobody ever thinks that. So in all our waking life, in all our dreams, even in deep sleep, even if we don't think I am, I still am. Because I'm the same one who wakes up. Now this I am is continuous in waking, dreaming, deep sleep, in all the days of our life. It was there when we were babies, we were there when we were children, teenagers, young people, old people. All the time that I am is constant, my own presence. So that is indubitable. It doesn't depend upon the condition of the body. I am. Healthy or sick, old or young, male or female, I am. It doesn't depend upon the condition of the mind. Happy or sad, I am happy. I am sad. So I am is constant. Happy or sad keeps coming and going. You see? So all of that. Memory. It doesn't depend on memory. I cannot recall. My memory is not what it used to be. I am, but my memory is failing now. But that I am is never doubted. Yeah. My own existence is never doubted. So this is the first cornerstone uh, of the two things I want to say. One is my own existence. Just look. It's, it is obvious that I exist. Each of us. Yeah. This was uh, not only Descartes. Hundreds of years ago, Shankaracharya says, Yaeva tasya nirakarta tasya atmasa. Whoever doubts the existence of the Atman is the Atman of that very doubter. So if you think that, um, all this Atman, Brahman, uh, is it true or not? Well, that's the demonstration that it's true that you exist. So the self-evident. My own existence is, is beyond doubt. All right. Now, here is the thing which I wanted to say in the first question itself. Let me ask this question. How do you know that? I am. But how do I know that? See, this... Ca this um, microphone is, it exists. But how do I know this? Because I see it, I can touch it, and so on and so forth. How do I know that I am? This flower exists, I know this. How? Through my eyes. I am the knower, the flower is the known, eyes are the instrument of knowledge. Knower, known, instrument of knowledge. Now I am, you yourself, the knower. How do you know the knower? You don't doubt that you exist. But how is it that you don't doubt that you exist? What is the instrument of knowledge there? Uh, now, think about it. Here is the beauty, <laughs> a very interesting uh, little bit of reasoning here. Everything is known in this way. Knower, knowable instrument of knowledge. Now, if the I, I am, were to be known in that way, something strange will happen. What is the strange thing? The I am will become an object of knowledge. And it will require another I am to know, to know it. And then some kind of instrument is required between the I am, the, the old I am and the new I am. <laughs> and that I am will have to be known. For that you require a third I am, a third self, which will be the knower. And that will have to be known. You require a fourth one. And this is called regressus ad infinitum. It's an infinite regress, which is regarded as a fallacy in philosophy. In Sanskrit, anavastha dosha, the, fa the f um, fault of not having a ground. Not, you will never come to a stop. Two problems will come from this. One is the regressus ad infinitum, the anavastha dosha, that is the regression back to infinity. You will have no end of I am's. And not only that, 
no knowledge would be possible see to know this the first thing that is established is i am then i deploy instrument of knowledge called eyes then the existence of this object is revealed to me but if the i am the beginning of this process of knowledge were not established if there was another one before that another one before that i would never come to this i am which will be going to know the uh, the microphone you see that infinite regress will prevent me from knowing anything at all because i the knower is not established it will immediately go into a, an infinite regress so two problems will ha happen one is the fault of infinite regress anavastha dosha the second is impossibility of any kind of knowledge at all clearly you are you exist i am and i know this also but i don't know this by this method of knower knowable instrument of knowledge then how do i know it i clearly know it here is what vedanta says he says the i am vedanta says the i am is self luminous swaprakasha it's not only self evident it is self luminous self revealing i exist there's absolutely no doubt about it and i am also i'm not only exist i shine i reveal myself all the time it's not an unknown existence so i am and i shine aham is sanskrit aham asmi sada bhami bhami means i shine upanishad says that um, that shining everything else shines by its light everything here is revealed tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati you shining everything else shines everything else means you shining the i am shining then the mind shines by its own by the light of that i am the mind shining the senses are illumined the senses shining you then can say not only i am but i can think i can remember i can decide i can imagine that's all mind and also with the senses shining i can see and i can hear and i smell and i taste and i touch behind it all is the i am which is indubitable self evident that's number 1 and self luminous in sanskrit swaprakasha it does not require another knower and another process of knowing to reveal the i am think about this then all doubt will go that um not only it sounds true when i hear this non dual teachings but also in my direct experience at least a glimmer of understanding begins to dawn what is meant by the, you know the ever present pure awareness that's basically that's just you so that will become become clear every doubt every doubt reveals it confirms the i am the self evident nature of the i am and the self shining self luminous nature of the i am that will become clear use the doubt the greatest proof uh, is the doubt itself that's the beauty of advaita vedanta if you take something like existence of god then the doubt cuts at the very root of your faith yeah. every theistic religion has to struggle to prove the existence of god in christian theology you have the five great proofs of the existence of god saint augustine and saint thomas aquinas they develop these proofs in indian uh, vaishnava theology you have uh, the nayakas more than 1000 years ago when they were debating with the buddhists the buddhists said there's no immortal soul there is no god and the hindu dualists tried to prove that there is a soul and there is god so they developed 10 9 proofs of the existence of god and so on but these trying to prove the existence of god means what the doubt is there it can be doubted belief in god that's why it's possible to believe in god is possible not to believe in god if you believe, think you i am a staunch believer in god listen to christopher hitchens for a while <laughs> slowly the staunch belief will be shaken a little bit at least <laughs> richard dawkins daniel dennett so it's possible to doubt but i am nobody ever doubts it so it's self evident and it's self luminous it is does not depend on anything else for expressing it. it 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 shines and because you shine you are shining therefore else therefore all else all sources of knowledge and all knowables are revealed to you by your own light these are not um uh, you know philosophical speculation it's just the way things are now one last point 
He said, how can it become so powerful, so effortless, so continuous that um, you know, always you will clearly see it's Brahman alone which exists. Here, this requires manifestation. This is what is called Jivan Mukti. It's not enough to understand it. It's not even enough to um, you know, ga gain some clarity about it, conviction. Understanding then is followed by clarity. Clarity and understanding go together. There's no doubt anymore. Then conviction comes. It's absolutely true. But even after that, one must live accordingly. Yeah. If I am that one consciousness, then you and I are not different. I really can never be angry with you. I really can never ever hate you. I can never see the slightest difference between you and me. I really cannot be upset with the um, problems of the body, ill health, pain, old age, disease and inevitable death of the body should be nothing to me. I am limitless existence consciousness. I also will not go through ups and downs with the inevitable ups and downs of the mind. But that will be a struggle. The more we are able to manifest our understanding, clarity and conviction, the more you will be able to say with confidence, I not only know, I not only understand, I am not only convinced, but it's an effortless fact for me. One limitless existence, consciousness bliss exists and in that the entire universe appears. Okay. That's a lot to be going on with. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Who's the next person who's asking a question there? Oh, the little kid. Come here. After him, we'll go back. Yes, yeah, sit there. Tell us your name Arvin. and ask the question. Louder. Arvin. Yes. How do we become a monk? How do we become monks? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yes. It was her question as well. Oh, her question too. She wants to become a monk, a nun. All right. What's her name? Tia. Gia. Gia. Okay. I can sit there. The two of them, yes. Even Nitla. Good. It's best to start young. <laughs> yeah. So how do you become a monk? Internally, everybody has to become a monk, monk-like, if you're a spiritual seeker. So if you feel that I want to know God or I want to know who am I really, and I don't want anything else. Not even uh, candy and uh, Netflix and <laughs> video games and everything else. No, I just want that. I want that. Then you're already a monk. You're already that. If you feel, I want to know God. I want to find God. Then you're already a monk. I don't want anything else. That's what I'm going to do all my life. If you think that I have no, there are other things I have to do. Fine, then you don't have to be a monk, but you still hold on to that uh, desire for finding God, to, to, to meet God, to see God. That's the answer. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> um, should we take one or a couple, couple of more questions from the internet audience and then, yes. From the grown-ups. <laughs> Sometimes children have the all right, so we'll, at the, after this, we'll go back to the person at the, at the right at the back. Uh, that, uh, yeah. She's been raising a hand for quite some time. Let's Hi. have the question. Um, this is from Vishal from Goa, India. Uh, Swamiji, when you talk about the realization of oneness while talking about consciousness in Advaita Vedanta, I assume you are strictly talking about the positive, blissful aspects related to the feelings of oneness or being one with the whole of life and humanity. How do you explain the deviant behaviors, oftentimes criminal and evil tendencies of humanity and the problem of evil within the realm of consciousness? Is there any effective remedy or solution to the problem of evil in Advaita Vedanta? All right, this is a classic question which every religion has to face, the problem of evil. Because every religion, whether theistic or non-theistic, especially the theistic religions, theistic religions talk about a perfect being, God. All powerful, and perfect, and good, and kind, and compassionate. 
but that does not sort of match up with the experience of the world that we have there's a lot of suffering in the world a lot of terrible stuff which goes on in the world and not all of it can be cured see when the cat catches a mouse it's natural but yet the mouse suffers there's no way you can stop that from happening even if you make a perfect human world if you remove all kinds everybody becomes a good person and does the best to be good still you can't remove natural suffering in the world so this is the question why would god create a universe like this where there is enormous amounts of incurable natural suffering plus also awful people who keep on adding more suffering than is necessary in this world the human evil that's created and us we also create a lot of mess for ourselves and for others we create suffering for ourselves and for others so why would god create such a, such a world this is called the problem of evil now before i go into that an observation about what he said uh, at the beginning uh, he said that when you talk about oneness in advaita vedanta i assume you're talking about the positive feelings of oneness and bliss and happiness and all of that no when advaita talks about oneness the oneness is not just a positive feeling it's metaphysical it's ontological advaita vedanta vedanta makes the claim we are really one it's not just we feel one it's it's not a nice feeling we are actually one and that's what advaita vedanta wants to demonstrate and based on that reality you begin to have the feelings of oneness you sense this oneness it's not uh, an imagination it's not a good thought mm-hmm. a universal brotherhood a universal sisterhood okay good but it's not like that it's um, it's it's an absolute reality metaphysical ontological reality that's what advaita vedanta claims all right be that as it may how does advaita vedanta how would it respond to the problem of evil now um this is one topic i can hold forth uh, at length i won't i just uh, tell you about this book which i have mentioned many times uh, the problem of evil in indian thought professor arthur herman he was a professor of indian philosophy at the university of uh, hawaii a uh, very great authority on uh, indian philosophy he wrote this book in which he considers this problem if god exists why is there uh, so, so much suffering in this in this universe what are the answers and every religion has tried to give an answer he has collected the answers from all the religions philosophies literature and he has got a list of 24 answers 24 answers you might say wow so there is an answer not one answer 24 why 24 because none of them are very <laughs> satisfactory <laughs> yeah. example i'll give you three or four a quick example so you will see that you have come across these answers at one time or the other um why is there suffering why would god permit suffering well suffering makes you strong it's character building so that's a character building answer you might say well in some cases it makes you strong but a baby is born and suffers and dies out of starvation or malaria or something like that uh, how did it make the baby strong you can also argue if the, that same example the cat catches the mouse and the mouse suffers terribly before dying how did the mouse become strong so you can always doubt this and then another example is this is the uh, most perfect world you are saying there's a lot of suffering but any other possible world would have much more suffering so this is the least possible suffering that the best that so the answer is the best the god could do so it's a very under <laughs> it's a very underperforming god <laughs> he would get laid off for lord from a job very soon in manhattan yeah. and get laid off very soon <laughs> um so these are different answers they have some grain of truth in each of them a lot of it can be doubted um so what is the answer from the hindu perspective professor herbin says that among all these answers the most convincing answer is the karma theory why is there so much suffering because of causality there are certain causes which are given rise to these conditions and uh, there are certain, certain causes which have given rise to these effects um, actions have consequences so there is a strict causality which um, karma gives rise to this kind of a world mixed world of suffering and pleasure and pain it's not god's fault god has created this environment and then we go through this what is the specific advaita answer to this the advaita vedanta answer is 
evil is caused by ignorance so our ignorance of what we are and what the world is that has led to this kind of suffering and if you want to go beyond suffering you can everybody can you realize what you are what the world is that it is one one limitless existence consciousness bliss you will go beyond suffering um to answer it no take it head on this question advaita vedanta perspective is the suffering is not ultimately real it's not denying that we are experiencing suffering but it's more like a nightmare a nightmare you do suffer it can be quite suffocating it can be and then you wake up out out of it gasping and scared and your heart pounding and then you realize oh it was just a bad dream now how did that help that suffering the suffering was there but the recognition of the falsity of those circumstances freed you from that suffering in sanskrit mithyatva nischaya that this world is an appearance in consciousness you as consciousness are safe you as pure being are safe ultimately it's okay not as you as that individual person see here's the thing people say that oh so if i'm spiritual then i'll be saved from suffering that's your promise yes but how and there's a person who was undergoing to undergo an operation a serious operation goes to the swami swami bless me um if i uh, i have this operation coming up and the swami said pray to god you, you'll be fine and this man said okay so if i pray to god i won't die the swami said no no that's not what i mean uh, even if you die you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> and he means it in absolute seriousness you as atman or brahman Uh, the body has died so many times we've had so many bodies which have come and go in our real nature is atman and brahman which is absolutely clear here evident here and there is no problem at all from that perspective from the body's perspective there is always a problem there is always a sickness and pain and inevitable death so that's how it takes you beyond suffering um all right now look it up that book if you want multiple answers how people have thought about this problem of evil throughout the centuries millennia um problem of evil in indian thought arthur herman one thing i would like to mention before i go ahead you know what's the real response whether it's advaita or any other form of hinduism buddhism christianity whatever or an atheist You know what's the first line of response? We always say in New York, first responder. The first response is to help. I was looking at the the annual report of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission, our organization, parent organization in India, and I looked at that. I thought this is the answer to the question: What is the response of Vedanta to the problem of evil? The response of Vedanta to the problem of evil. The first response, the first responder, is. the thousands of dispensaries hospitals schools colleges the relief activities going and standing next to a person who is suffering from famine or flood or earthquake or fire and extending a helping hand to feed the hungry to give provide medical treatment to the sick to provide treatment to the sick medical help to the sick to teach to provide education to the illiterate yeah. Vivekananda said he, he, my god the poor my god the sick my god the starving my god the wicked so i am going to worship god in in these ways to feed the hungry man to um, clothe the person without clothes to uh, ed- to give education to the one who has no opportunity for education to give medicines to the sick person that's the first response to the problem of evil then the philosophical response comes later that's not a, why shouldn't that be enough that will not be enough because you'll never ever solve anything deeply that way if the question will still remain after all efforts more or less the suffering continues in the world so you need a deep spiritual solution also but that comes next first help one young man came to vivekananda in india and said swami i close all the doors and windows of my room and sit and meditate and meditate and meditate but i have no peace of mind vivekananda said 
open the doors and windows of your room go out into the world there is the starving man the sick person go out and pour out your life in service of god in the form of suffering humanity you will get peace of mind another person young man like that there was a lot of sickness at that time the plague and um, he said how can i get peace of mind swami the swami vivekananda he said you go out and serve the people who are in front of you actually suffering go out and help <laughs> it doesn't work always because that young man said but if i get infected i'll die <laughs> and vivekananda said there is no hope for <laughs> that's a hopeless case I want to be spiritual but I don't want to give up anything at all of me. <laughs> no. Uh the lady at the at the back there. Yes, please come up here. And this gentleman next you are uh, you've been raising your hand. Please come and ask your question. Tell us your name and ask the question. Yes. And then we'll come to you there. Uh Pranam Swami ji. Yes. Uh, first question is Turn the yeah. microphone towards me. Yeah, uh my name is Jaya. Uh, my first question is that the uh, the purusha and prakriti mentioned in the bhagavad gita is the purusha the same as the pure consciousness that the first question of today referred to and the second thing is that we never have an opportunity to interview somebody who can say i am dead hmm. so when we say that i am changeless uh, i am imperishable how do i know how do i know yes all right so two questions Purusha prakriti when it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita is it the same purusha as pure consciousness which we talk about in Vedanta the answer is straight answer is yes uh, remember however just a technical note purusha prakriti is peculiarly the language of sankhya of sankhya philosophy so in sankhya philosophy purusha is uh, the self in the in indian languages purusha is often is understood as a male and prakriti as female it's not in that sense purusha is the self all of us whether we have male or female bodies we are purusha in the sense of consciousness only in sankhya purusha is multiple each of us is separately one purusha separate consciousness but in gita which is a vedanta text there's only one purusha that is the one consciousness like the one sun in the sky which is reflected in all parts of water so we are all that all of us all of us are that one consciousness not part of it just that one consciousness um so yes that's the meaning in the bhagavad gita the second one is we have never interviewed anybody who's dead so how do we know that after death also i exist i am this imperishable unchangeable i am the good question think about it why we don't if you really think about it then you'll be startled <coughs> see i think i am i have never had when i said i am that question should have come yes you think i am i am all the time we are thinking that just because we are alive but when we are dead we will not we won't have that i am will be gone that i am is gone so it's not that that i am is permanent it's just when the body is alive you feel you have the feeling of i am that could be the question follow this carefully in our own experience all the time we have the experience of i am all of us never have we ever had the experience of i am not it's impossible even to have that it's technically impossible it's sort of literally uh, in mathematicians will say trivially imp- impossible because to have an experience of i am not experience means i am without an experience how will you say anything now notice we also have no experience each of us no experience of being dead at least we don't remember so we cannot say from our experience when the body dies i will not be nobody has that experience our thinking plays a trick on us what we think is yeah yeah i know all that i have never i don't really have an experience of being dead but i see a lot of people who have died i have no i know a lot of people have died and they don't exist anymore they clearly cannot say i am that's our feeling and one day i too will die so and then i am will disappear that's what we think deep inside but we are making a clear logical fallacy here 
I am, I have this feeling internally. You are none of you are aware of my I am, as I am not aware of your I am. I only infer that you are having the same I am feeling because based on my own internal experiences. Based on my own internal experiences, I feel I am, I am conscious, I have all these experiences. So to these people, they seem very similar to me. So they also must be having this kind of an experience. Uh, so I'm talking about the inner experience of each of you, which I infer. When the body dies, what happens? I can no longer see your behavior, I cannot hear your words. And I jump to the conclusion that inner experience must have ceased. But how do you know that? Till, I'll repeat that in another way. As long as we are alive, when we look at each other, we think of as each, each other as persons. Not literally this living body, but something in that living body, embodied in that living body, a person, a sentient being, a person just like me, is in everybody. So when I'm thinking about you, I'm thinking about the person, not about the living body itself. This is associated with that person. But when the body is dead, I jump to the conclusion that that person is also dead. But did I have an experience of the person dying? No. That person who died, that person is not available to interact with me anymore. And I have jumped to the conclusion that person must be dead. Where does this come from? It comes from a deep-rooted identification with the body. That I am, somehow I am just this body. That's what all religions, forget Vedanta, you know, all religions, uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Sang, uh, you know, uh, Sankhya, all the different Indian philosophies, Jainism, and all varieties of Hinduism, Taoism, all of us, all religions of the world throughout history have had one thing in common. You are not the body itself. You are something more than the physical body. That much is common to all religions. So, how do I know that I will exist. Ask yourself, why am I asking this question? If I say, um, I see this table. If the table is destroyed, how do I know that I will exist? And say, so what a silly question, Swami. Uh, table is an object. You are not this object. Its existence and destruction does not, is, is nowhere connected to your existence and destruction. Equally, this body is an object. That's what Vedanta is trying to show you. Look at it. I mean, it's, it's literally nothing more than a complex biological object. Nothing else. How can it be you? That's, see, if we appreciate the hard problem of consciousness, not from a Vedantic perspective, just a pure consciousness studies perspective, just pure materialistic science perspective, how does consciousness come from a physical body? If we appreciate that question, will our uh, idea that the death of the body is the death of consciousness also will be shaken. That's a window. And this is connected to the question, how can science um, show that we are the self? This is how science is opening up windows. It cannot show you that you are pure consciousness, but it makes it more and more probable that what these ancient philosophies are saying um, could be true. I think we can take that and that will be all from the audience and we can take one more question from the internet and, and wrap up. First, let's see how much time this question takes. <laughs> Bikram, I have a question. I think this is related to some of the answers you already gave. Uh, I, I think in my understanding, in my readings of the, of the text, uh, I think consciousness permeates everything, it's almost transcendent, imminent reality. And it, it, is, it, is, it, it is not related to uh, animate life or inanimate life, and it goes everywhere. Mm. So uh, I think maybe that was not, that is not commonly understood in the conversations. We somehow associate uh, consciousness to a life. Mm. And I think that is not the case in my understanding. That was just a clarification. The second, and uh, perhaps a more technical question I think is, uh, and maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding, misreading some of the texts I'm reading. Uh, Ishwara is known as Brahman and Maya. 
the combination of all right where you're going just hold on to this question let me make an observation about your observation okay <laughs> that you said two things consciousness goes everywhere it's all pervading it's not directly just connected you know just with animate bodies with life yeah. that's not usually understood in these conversations that's what you said now there's some nuance to this consciousness does have a kind of intimate connection with life why why it's because uh, in life consciousness is most directly manifest not that consciousness is produced by a living body but a living body can manifest consciousness best it's just like the mirror example i gave you of all the objects here dull dead matter one more object dull dead matter is a mirror but it does something remarkable it reflects you quite well with high uh, you know high quality reflection it can do that a living body can reflect consciousness or channel consciousness or manifest consciousness as it is doing right now uh, in all of our bodies and minds this living body in, in vedanta it's called the the life there is called sukshma sharira it has three components with um, the pranamaya manomaya vigyanamaya three sheets the vital sheet the mental sheet and the intellect sheet so when it is there consciousness is most manifest you would not con- according to advaita vedanta consciousness is here also right it is here also but here it seems to be a conscious being why what what's the difference between this and this here there is a subtle body with life therefore life is special and so the, in that sense life is a little more valuable than non living entities that much from a vedantic perspective one last point but a very metaphysical point you said it's everywhere when we say uh, advaitins would say everywhere is in consciousness it's not that consciousness is everywhere space is in consciousness once you accept space then you have to say consciousness is everywhere it's not local once you accept time then you have to say consciousness is eternal it's not temporary so accepting time and space it's like your dream in your dreams so you have places and people and sky and earth but it's nothing but you you are dreaming it all up so one way of saying it is in all the places and sky and earth in your dreams you are there everywhere you are pervading everywhere but it's more actually more accurate and true to say that the everywhere in your dreams is in you it's not that there is a space and somehow you go and fill it up in your dreams rather the space is imagined in your mind the time is imagined in your mind just like that but now your question yeah the question was uh, i think i was struggling with uh, trying to understand with the aranya swami uh, when i think somewhere he mentions ishwar is brahman and maya together uh brahman is a different to, uh, don't lean so close to the mic brahman is a is a uh is is a, it's nirguna it has no quality yes and um, maya has a name and a form yes so how do what is the glue that ties those two together yeah there aren't two and they are not tied together so from a nirguna brahman perspective it is just nirguna brahman always without any uh, objective qual in any attributes it is just bare existence consciousness place and maya doesn't have the same level of ontological reality so in advaita vedanta is very neat that way uh-huh. so maya is an appearance in nirguna brahman and with that appearance nirguna brahman is now called ishwara or bhagavan so maya is not a second a countable second apart from the absolute with which it gets associated no it isn't there's only one the absolute there was is and continues to be that but then we have to account for this amazing display what is the display here how is it one limitless existence consciousness bliss comes up as millions of living beings billions of living beings and and non living vast star systems down from quasars down to quarks this tremendous this the variety how does it come about then the answer is maya but it's not a second reality apart from brahman so from an advaitic perspective they are not really worried 
it's like gold and you put it a particular shape give a particular shape to it it becomes a necklace and you call it a necklace and you use it in a particular way and then you melt down that gold and you put it in another shape becomes a bracelet and you call it a bracelet and you use it in a particular way so name form and use keep changing like that name form and use if you call it maya that's what it's in fact maya is defined as that nama rupa vyavahara um then gold plus that maya becomes the creator the god of bracelets and <laughs> and necklaces and rings and all kinds of gold ornaments however if you are strictly sticking to what's real you will say only gold is real there because the name the form and the use they are all they're nothing other than that gold they don't exist without that gold they're not accountable second apart from that gold you know if you say no 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 it's gold but it's also a bracelet can you show me the two separately you cannot you can show me the gold separately the same gold continues in the necklace and in the ring and in the tiara but the bracelet does not continue the bracelet was something that temporarily appeared and disappeared in that same gold so this temporary appearance and disappearance of multiplicity of names and forms though it seems to be a second it seems to be a world of multiplicity it isn't there's only one and that's you look at it logically not psychologically psychologically it seems to be a world of great diversity logically if you are going to be um, very bloody minded about it how many are there even when the world is appearing with this tremendous diversity only one your precise question was what is the glue that binds brahman and maya that presupposes there are two and it requires a glue to bind them but there aren't two let me ask you what is so here's a table it's wood and it's a particular shape what is the glue that binds the wood to that shape please you'll say this swami the question is wrongly phrased you if you say if you glue the clock to the table you can talk about the glue which glued the clock to the table but the shape of the table is nothing different from the table it doesn't need to be glued to the table hmm. it appears to be different but it has no existence of its own and that's the magic of maya the amazing display of samsara hmm. when you realize what it is that it is brahman then there'll be another amazing display of nirvana <laughs> but both samsara and nirvana are displays in one reality which is brahman which is you in the state of ignorance the same thing is appears as samsara all the troubles of the world and in the state of enlightenment realization the same thing will appear to you as nirvana moksha you still have a question uh, let me think about it so yes <laughs> <laughs> now it's worth thinking about because this is for uh, thousands of years people are having this question non duality is pretty obvious when you are logical about it but psychologically we rebel against it because we are we hold the psyche holds on to multiplicity duality and invests it with reality all right so shall we have a, one, more. one more question from the internet audience yes. thank you thank you swami uh, this question is from pooja sabawal from san francisco Uh, Swamiji, we are told that there's only one universal consciousness, and we are that very consciousness, and that this world is Maya, an illusion, and we don't really exist. So then, where does the karma theory fit in? If we are an existential illusion, then how can we generate karma? Mm. Notice one thing there: it's all one consciousness, and the whole of the world is an illusion. or an appearance and we don't really exist uh 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 <laughs> that we don't really exist where did you get that from advaita vedanta is just the opposite you are the only thing that really exists if you say in a dream whatever is appearing in the dream it's a part of the dream it really doesn't exist but there's one thing that exists you the dreamer exists because of which the dream appears that was the whole story of the emperor janaka who dreamt that he was defeated in a battle and then he lost his kingdom and uh, then he woke up and then he started thinking uh, 
is this real or was that real? And the great sage Ashtavakra comes to him and says that that is that defeat and the enemy and the loss of your kingdom, it's not there now. You can clearly see it was a dream. So that's not real. But this, the glory and power you have sitting on the throne surrounded by your um, you know, wealth and magnificence, this was not there in that dream. So this is also not real. Then is nothing real? And he says, you were there to experience the dream and you are here to experience this state also. So you are the reality. So Advaita Vedanta, one thing that Advaita Vedanta never compri- compromises on is it never says we don't exist. In fact, you do exist. You are the reality. It's just that you don't know what you truly are. You're, what is the American phrase? You're selling yourself short. <laughs> You're selling yourself short. You are limitless existence. Everything else seems to exist because you exist. Everything else is experienced because of your light. There is meaning, purpose, value, beauty, bliss, joy in life because you are Anand, the bliss itself. The universe exists borrowing its existence from you. All knowledge and experience is possible borrowing its light from you. All things which give you joy, pleasure, uh, which, which seem meaningful and worthy, they borrow their purpose, meaningfulness from you. Sat Chit Ananda. Now the particular question she asks is karma. Um, so how, if you are one Brahman, pure existence, consciousness, bliss, then who's karma, who's generating karma? How can we say? Well, the answer in Advaita Vedanta is actually, even karma is part of the illusion. As long as you think that you are this limited body and mind, then cause and effect have their sway on you. Vivekananda said, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. So actions have consequences. Causes will give rise to effects. What we are experiencing now are the effects of things in ancient times. And what we do now will be experienced in future times. That's the story. Emphasis on the word story. Uh-huh. That's taken as real from a dualistic perspective. That's real. But uh, from an Advaitic perspective, that's part of the movie. That's part of the dream. That's part of the story. That makes sense. But it's still a story. What's beyond the story is you. Limitless existence, consciousness, bliss. Vivekananda's poem. Good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. Whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. Wears the form means as long as we are identified with this particular body and mind, Sarva Priyananda. It has been produced by a chain of cause and effect stretching back many lives. And I cannot escape this. It will continue. Whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. Then what about Vedanta? What, what's, what's the, what are we doing here? Then he goes on, to, Vivekananda goes on to say, But far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. No, thou art that sannyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. Realize who you are, you will see you are not part of the movie. Your destiny is not determined by some Hollywood scriptwriter. You are that on which the movie is playing. Multiple movies may play, tragedies and comedies, or they may not play, you are still exactly the same. You make possible these movies. You make karma possible. The dream of karma, you make it possible. But you are not trapped in the the dream of karma. You are beyond it. You transcend it. You just have to realize what we we realize what we truly are. You will see you are already free. He says uh, another place, the same poem. Chains, though of gold, are not less strong to bind. If you're bad karma, it's like an iron chain, shackled, suffering after suffering after suffering. Things go badly. Golden chain. Things are going very well for me. (laughs) Whatever I I want, I'm having a really good time, a wonderful life. That's still a chain. And very soon it can become an iron chain also. So so Vivekananda says, then off with them, sannyasi bold, say om, tat, sat, om. Beyond the chains, let go thy hold. Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. Let go thy hold, sannyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. Its freedom is directly available here. It's the, it's the most direct, obvious thing. It's your nature. It's here. Right now, shining forth all the time. Snap out of it. 
uh, Vivekananda says, uh, it's a very radical statement. What ideal will you follow? There is no ideal besides you. It points you back to yourself. Never fear because you are that immortal existence. So no fear, you will not die. Never Be at peace for you are forever beyond sin and virtue. Good karma and bad karma, you are forever beyond that. We are already beyond that. These are dreams, you know, vapors set up by, um, by Maya. You are beyond it all. Whom will you worship? Because the Atman is all, which means you are all. Whom will you worship? And then he goes on to say, Let go of all talking and all thinking. Say only, I am the Atman, I am the Atman. That is all that is needed. So on that very high note, <laughs> let us... Uh, you you have, a, have a comment. Can, can you say something from there instead of coming up here? There's a gentleman right at the back. Yeah, my question is like, you know, does the witness of Sakshi, does it have any... So he was very excited, so I think we should give him the last word. <laughs> no, no. So yes. like my, my question is like, you know, the, the witness, the Sakshi, what we say that I am, because the, this I am, like, you know, I have some kind of registry. I am registering all my, like, you know, observations, where I am going and where I am coming from. The actual, the witness, does it have any registry? Will it register anything? Will it register anything? With the mind it will? Just like with the, your eyes open, you can see me? Yeah. With your eyes closed, you cannot see me. But you would still exist. Yes. When you are seeing me, you exist. When you do not see me, you, you still exist. So the I am exists in spite of whether it registers anything or it does not register anything. So it registers experiences with the mind and the senses. It will register. It will see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Because without it, no seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching is possible. So all registering is possible because of the I am. Without the I am, nothing will be possible. The next question might be then the I am depends on the mind and the body and the senses. Is that the question? Yeah, I'm kind of like... Ah, me. right. So I know. <laughs> it depends on the mind and the body. And so that's the problem in Sankhya. That's a dualism. Consciousness depends on matter. Matter depends on consciousness. However, in Advaita, that's not a problem. Yeah. Because mind, body, world, they are also nothing apart from the I am. It is that, that I am which appears to itself as this objective universe. Advaita, non-duality. Whatever appears to be second, separate from you, is actually nothing apart from you. Think about the dream example. In the dream example, I am sitting and drinking a cup of tea um, in the you know, park or somewhere like that. Some very beautiful scenery and everything. And then I say, it is because of I, the consciousness, with this body and the tongue, I am able to taste the tea. With this I, I am able to see the park. So I am dependent on the eyes and the tongue for experiencing things. But the fact is, when you wake up, you realize, I, the dreamer, was not only the one there sitting in the park and sipping the tea. I was the tea also. I was the park also. I was the sky also. I was the earth also. I was the mind and the body also. So mind, body, tree, park, sky, tea, tea, all of that depends upon me, the dreamer. Similarly, here also, you are that one limitless awareness on which the entire universe depends. You don't depend on anything at all. Good. It's a statement of independence. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu As remembering, Vivekananda said, this is the truth that even children can understand easily. Because <laughs> it's the simplest truth. Advaita, non-duality.